Retief of the Red Tape Mountain by Keith Laumer Narrated by William Skye Retief knew the importance of sealed orders, and the need to keep them that way. It's true, Consul Passwin said. I requested assignment as principal officer at a small post, but I had in mind one of those charming resort worlds with only an occasional visa problem or perhaps a distressed spaceman or two a year. Instead, I'm zookeeper to these confounded settlers. And not for one world, mind you, but eight. He stared glumly at Vice Consul Retief. Still, Retief said, it gives an opportunity to travel. Travel? the Consul barked. I hate travel. Here in this backwater system particularly. He paused, blinked at Retief and cleared his throat. Not that a bit of travel isn't an excellent thing for a junior officer. Marvellous experience. He turned to the wall screen and pressed a button. A system triagram appeared, eight luminous green dots arranged around a larger disc representing the primary. He picked up a pointer, indicating the innermost planet. The situation on Adorbi is nearing crisis. The confounded settlers, a mere handful of them, have managed, as usual, to stir up trouble with an intelligent indigenous life form, the Jack. I can't think why they bother, merely for a few oases among the endless deserts. However, I have, at last, received authorization from Sector Headquarters to take certain action. He swung back to face Retief. I'm sending you in to handle the situation, Retief, under sealed orders. He picked up a fat buff envelope. A pity they didn't see fit to order the terrestrial settlers out weeks ago, as I suggested. Now it is too late. I'm expected to produce a miracle, a rapprochement between terrestrial and adoban, and a division of territory. It's idiotic. However, failure would look very bad in my record, so I shall expect results. He passed the buff envelope across to Retief. I understood that Adobe was uninhabited, Retief said, until the terrestrial settlers arrived. Apparently that was an erroneous impression, Passwin fixed Retief with a watery eye. You'll follow your instructions to the letter. In a delicate situation such as this, there must be no impulsive impromptu element introduced. This approach has been worked out in detail at Sector. You need merely implement it. Is that entirely clear? Has anyone at headquarters ever visited Adobe? Of course not. They all hate travel. If there are no other questions, you'd best be on your way. The mail run departs the dorm in less than an hour. What's this native life form like? Retief asked, getting to his feet. When you get back, said Passwin, you tell me. The male pilot, a leathery veteran with quarter-inch whiskers, spat toward a stained corner of the compartment, leaned close to the screen. They shooting going on down there, he said. See them white puffs over the edge of the desert? I'm supposed to be preventing the war, said Retief. It looks like I'm a little late. The pilot's head snapped around. War? he yelped. Nobody told me there was a war going on on Doby. If that's what that is, I'm getting out of here. Hold on, said Retief. I've got to get down. They won't shoot at you. They sure won't, Sonny. I ain't giving them the chance. He started punching keys on the console. Retief reached out, caught his wrist. Maybe you didn't hear me. I said I've got to get down. The pilot plunged against the restraint, swung a punch that Retief blocked casually. Are you nuts? the pilot screeched. There's plenty shooting going on for me to see at fifty miles out. The mail must go through, you know. Okay, you're so dead set on getting killed, you take the skiff. I'll tell him to pick up the remains next trip. You're a pal. I'll take your offer. The pilot jumped to the lifeboat hatch and cycled it open. Get in. We're closing fast. Then birds might take it into their heads to lob one this way. Retief crawled into the narrow cockpit of the skiff, glanced over the controls. The pilot ducked out of sight, came back, handed Retief a heavy old-fashioned power pistol. Long as you're going in, might as well take this. Thanks. Retief shoved the pistol in his belt. I hope you're wrong. I'll see they pick you up when the shooting's over, one way or another. The hatch clanked shut. A moment later there was a jar as the skiff dropped away, 
followed by heavy buffeting in the backwash from the departing mail boat. Retief watched the tiny screen, hands on the manual controls. He was dropping rapidly. Forty miles, thirty-nine. A crimson blip showed on the screen, moving out. Retief felt sweat pop out on his forehead. The red blip meant heavy radiation from a warhead. Somebody was playing around with an outlawed but by no means unheard of fission weapon. But maybe it was just on a high trajectory and had no connection with the skiff. Retief altered course to the south. The blip followed. He checked instrument readings, gripped the controls, watching. This was going to be tricky. The missile bored closer. At five miles, Retief threw the light skiff into maximum acceleration, straight toward the oncoming bomb. Crushed back in the padded seat, he watched the screen, correcting course minutely. The proximity fuse should be set for no more than 1,000 yards. At a combined speed of two miles per second, the skiff flashed past the missile, and Retief was slammed violently against the restraining harness in the concussion of the explosion, a mile astern, and harmless. Then the planetary surface was rushing up with frightening speed. Retief shook his head, kicked in the emergency retro drive. Points of light arced up from the planet face below. If they were ordinary chemical warheads, the skiff's meteor screen should handle them. The screen flashed brilliant white, then went dark. The skiff flipped on its back. Smoke filled the tiny compartment. There was a series of shocks, a final bone-shaking concussion, then stillness, broken by the ping of hot metal contracting. Coughing, Retief disengaged himself from the shock webbing. He beat out sparks in his lap, groped underfoot for the hatch and wrenched it open. A wave of hot jungle air struck him. He lowered himself to a bed of shattered foliage, got to his feet and dropped flat as a bullet whined past his ear. He lay listening. Stealthy movements were audible from the left. He inched his way to the shelter of a broad, bold dwarf tree. Somewhere a song lizard burbled. Whining insects circled, scented alien life, buzzed off. There was another rustle of foliage from the underbrush five yards away. A bush quivered, then a low bough dipped. Retief edged back around the trunk, eased down behind a fallen log. A stocky man in grimy leather shirt and shorts appeared, moving cautiously, a pistol in his hand. As he passed, Retief rose, leaped the log and tackled him. They went down together. The stranger gave one short yell, then struggled in silence. Retief flipped him onto his back, raised a fist. Hey! the settler yelled. You're as human as I am! Maybe I'll look better after a shave, said Retief. What's the idea of shooting at me? Let me up. My name's Potter. Sorry about that. I figured it was a flapjack boat. Looks just like him. I took a shot when I saw something move. Didn't know it was a terrestrial. Who are you? What are you doing here? We're pretty close to the edge of the oases. That's flapjack country over there. He waved a hand toward the north where the desert lay. I'm glad you're a poor shot. That missile was too close for comfort. Missile, eh? Must be flapjack artillery. We got nothing like that. I heard there was a full-fledged war brewing, said Retief. I didn't expect... Good, Potter said. We figured a few of you boys from Ivory would be joining up when you heard. You are from Ivory? Yes, um... Hey, you must be Lemuel's cousin. Good night. I oh, pretty near made a bad mistake. Lemuel's a tough man to explain something to. I'm... Keep your head down. These damn flapjacks have got some wicked hand weapons. Come on. He moved off silently on all fours. Retief followed. They crossed two hundred yards of rough country before Potter got to his feet, took out a soggy bandana and mopped his face. You move good for a city man. I thought you folks on ivory just sat under those domes and red dials. But I guess being Lemuel's cousin you was raised different. As a matter of fact, I have to get you some real clothes though. Those city duds don't stand up on Doby. Retief looked down at the charred, torn and sweat-soaked powder blue blazer and slacks. This outfit seemed pretty rough and ready back home, he said, but I guess leather has its points. Let's get on back to camp. We'll just about make it by sundown. And look, don't say anything to Lemuel about me thinking you were a flapjack. 
I won't, but... Potter was on his way, loping off up a gentle slope. Rotif pulled off the sodden blazer, dropped it over a bush, added his string tie, and followed Potter. We're damn glad you're here, mister, said a fat man with two revolvers belted across his paunch. We can use every hand. We're in bad shape. We ran into the flapjacks three months ago, and we haven't made a smart move since. First, we thought they were a native form we hadn't run into before. Fact is, one of the boys shot one, thinking it was fair game. I guess that was the start of it. He stirred the fire, added a stick. And then a bunch of them hit Swayze's farm here, Potter said, killed two of his cattle and pulled back. I figure they thought the cows were people, said Swayze. They were out for revenge. How could anybody think a cow was folks? Another man put in. They don't look nothing like... Don't be so dumb, Bert, said Swayze. They'd never seen Terry's before. They know better now. Bert chuckled. Sure do. We showed him the next time, didn't we, Potter? Got four. They walked right up to my place a couple days after the first time, Swayze said. We were ready for him. Peppered him good. They cut and run. Flopped, you mean? Ugliest looking critters you ever saw. Looks just like a old piece of dirty blanket humping around. It's been going on this way ever since. They raid and then we raid. But lately they've been bringing some big stuff into it. Now they've got some kind of pint-sized airships and automatic rifles. We've lost four men now and a dozen more in the freezer waiting for the med ship. We can't afford it. The colony's got less than 300 able-bodied men. But we're hanging on to our farms, said Potter. All these oases are old seabeds, a mile deep, solid topsoil. And there's a couple of hundred others we haven't touched yet. The flapjacks won't get him while there's a man alive. The whole system needs the food we can raise, Bert said. These farms we're trying to start won't be enough, but they'll help. We've been yelling for help to the CDT over on Ivory, said Potter. But you know these embassy stooges. We heard they were sending some kind of bureaucrat in here to tell us to get out and give the oases to the flapjacks, said Swayze. He tightened his mouth. We're waiting for him. Meanwhile, we got reinforcements coming up, eh, boys? Bert winked at Retief. We put out the word back home. We all got relatives on Ivory and Verge. Shut up, you damn fool, a deep voice grated. Lemuel, Potter said. Nobody else could sneak up on us like that. If I'd have been a flapjack, I'd have ate you alive, the newcomer said, moving into the ring of fire, a tall, broad-faced man in grimy leather. He eyed Retief. Who's that? What do you mean? Potter spoke in the silence. He's your cousin. He ain't no cousin of mine, Lemuel said slowly. He stepped to Retief. Who you spying for, stranger? He rasped. Retief got to his feet. I think I should explain. A short-nosed automatic appeared in Lemuel's hand, a clashing note against his fringed buckskins. Skip the talk. I know a fink when I see one. Just for a change, I'd like to finish a sentence, said Retief, and I suggest you put your courage back in your pocket before it bites you. You talk too damn fancy to suit me. Maybe, but I'm talking to suit me. Now, for the last time, put it away. Lemuel stared at Retief. You given me orders? Retief's left fist shot out smacked Lemuel's face dead centre. He stumbled back, blood starting from his nose, the pistol fired into the dirt as he dropped it. He caught himself, jumped for Retief, and met a straight right that snapped him onto his back, out cold. Wow, said Potter. The stranger took Lem. In two punches. One, said Swayze. That first one was just a love tap. Bert froze. Ark, boys, he whispered. In the sudden silence a night lizard called. Retief strained, heard nothing. He narrowed his eyes, peered past the fire. With a swift lunge, he seized up the bucket of drinking water, dashed it over the fire, threw himself flat. He heard the others hit the dirt a split second behind him. You move fast for a city man, breathed Swayze beside him. You see pretty good too. We'll split and take him from two sides. You and Bert from the left, me and Potter from the right. No, said Retief. You wait here. 
I'm going out alone. What's the idea? Later. Sit tight and keep your eyes open. Retief took a bearing on a treetop faintly visible against the sky and started forward. Five minutes stealthy progress brought him to a slight rise of ground. With infinite caution, he raised himself, risking a glance over an outcropping of rock. The stunted trees ended just ahead. Beyond, he could make out the dim contour of rolling desert. Flapjack country. He got to his feet, clambered over the stone, still hot after a day of tropical heat, and moved forward twenty yards. Around him, he saw nothing but drifted sand, palely visible in the starlight, and the occasional shadow of jutting shale slabs. Behind him, the jungle was still. He sat down on the ground to wait. It was ten minutes before a movement caught his eye. Something had separated itself from a dark mass of stone, glided across a few yards of open ground to another shelter. Retief watched. Minutes passed. The shape moved again, slipped into a shadow ten feet distant. Retief felt the butt of the power pistol with his elbow. His guess had better be right this time. There was a sudden rasp like leather against concrete, and a flurry of sand as the flapjack charged. Retief rolled aside, then lunged, threw his weight on the flopping flapjack, a yard square, three inches thick at the centre, and all muscle. The ray-like creature heaved up, curled backward, its edge rippling, to stand on the flattened rim of its encircling sphincter. It scrabbled with prehensile fringe tentacles for a grip on Retief's shoulders. He wrapped his arms around the alien and struggled to his feet. The thing was heavy, a hundred pounds at least. Fighting as it was, it seemed more like five hundred. The flapjack reversed its tactics, went limp. Retief grabbed, felt a thumb slip into an orifice. The alien went wild. Retief hung on, dug the thumb in deeper. Sorry, fellow, he muttered between clenched teeth. Eye gouging isn't gentlemanly, but it's effective. The flapjack fell still, only its fringes rippling slowly. Retief relaxed the pressure of his thumb. The alien gave a tentative jerk. The thumb dug in. The alien went limp again, waiting. Now we understand each other, said Retief. Take me to your leader. Twenty minutes' walk into the desert brought Retief to a low rampart of thorn branches, the flapjack's outer defensive line against Terry Forays. It would be as good a place as any to wait for the move by the flapjacks. He sat down and eased the weight of his captive off his back, but kept a firm thumb in place. If his analysis of the situation was correct, a flapjack picket should be along before too long. A penetrating beam of red light struck Retief in the face, blinked off. He got to his feet. The captive flapjack rippled its fringe in an agitated way. Retief tensed his thumb in the eye socket. Sit tight, he said. Don't try to do anything hasty. His remarks were falling on deaf ears, or no ears at all, but the thumb spoke as loudly as words. There was a slither of sand. Another. He became aware of a ring of presences drawing closer. Retief tightened his grip on the alien. He could see a dark shape now, looming up almost to his own six-three. It looked like the flapjacks came in all sizes. A low rumble sounded, like a deep-throated growl. It strummed on, faded out. Retief cocked his head, frowning. Try it two octaves higher, he said. Oh? Sorry, is that better? A clear voice came from the darkness. That's fine, Retief said. I'm here to arrange a prisoner exchange. Prisoners? But we have no prisoners. Sure you have. Me. Is it a deal? Ah, yes, of course. Quite equitable. What guarantees do you require? The word of a gentleman is sufficient. Retief released the alien. It flopped once, disappeared into the darkness. If you'd care to accompany me to our headquarters, the voice said, we can discuss our mutual concerns in comfort. Delighted. Red lights blinked briefly. Retief glimpsed a gap in the thorny barrier, stepped through it. He followed dim shapes across warm sand to a low cave-like entry, faintly lit with a reddish glow. 
I must apologise for the awkward design of our comfort dome, said the voice. Had we known we would be honoured by a visit. Think nothing of it, Retief said. We diplomats are trained to crawl. Inside, with knees bent and head ducked under the five-foot ceiling, Retief looked around at the walls of pink-toned nacre, a floor like burgundy-coloured grass spread with silken rugs, and a low table of polished red granite that stretched down the centre of the spacious room, set out with silver dishes and rose-crystal drinking tubes. "'Let me congratulate you,' the voice said. Retief turned. An immense flapjack hung with crimson trappings rippled at his side. The voice issued from a disc strapped to its back. "'You fight well. I think we will find in each other worthy adversaries.' Thanks. I'm sure the test would be interesting, but I'm hoping we can avoid it. Avoid it? Retief heard a low humming coming from the speaker in the silence. Well, let us dine, the mighty flapjack said at last. We can resolve these matters later. I am called Hoshik of the Mosaic of the Two Dawns. I'm Retief, Hoshik waited expectantly. Of the Mountain of Red Tape, Retief added. Take place, Retief said Hoshik. I hope you won't find our rude couches uncomfortable. Two other large flapjacks came into the room, communed silently with Hoshik. Pray forgive our lack of translating devices, he said to Retief. Permit me to introduce my colleagues. A small flapjack rippled the chamber, bearing on its back a silver tray laden with aromatic food. The waiter served the four diners, filled the drinking tubes with yellow wine. It smelled good. I trust you'll find these dishes palatable, said Hoshik. Our metabolisms are much alike, I believe. Retief tried the food. It had a delicious nut-like flavour. The wine was indistinguishable from Chateau de Chem. It was an unexpected pleasure to encounter your party here, said Hoshik. I confess at first we took you for an indigenous earth-grubbing form, but we were soon disabused of that notion. He raised a tube, manipulating it deftly with his fringed tentacles. Retief returned the salute and drank. Of course, Hoshik continued, as soon as we realised that you were sportsmen like ourselves, we attempted to make amends by providing a bit of activity for you. We've ordered out our heavier equipment and a few trained skirmishers, and soon we'll be able to give you an adequate show. Or so I hope. Additional skirmishers, said Retief. How many, if you don't mind my asking? For the moment, perhaps only a few hundred. Thereafter, well, I'm sure we can arrange that between us. Personally, I would prefer a contest of limited scope. No nuclear or radiation effect weapons. Such a bore screening the spawn for deviations. Though I confess we've come upon some remarkably useful sports. The ranger form, such as you made captive, for example. Simple-minded, of course, but a fantastically keen tracker. Oh, by all means, Retief said. No atomics. As you pointed out, spawn sorting is a nuisance. And then, too, it's wasteful of troops. Ah, well, they are, after all, expendable. But we agree, no atomics. Have you tried the ground guac eggs? Rather a specialty of my mosaic. Delicious, said Retief. I wonder, have you considered eliminating weapons altogether? A scratchy sound issued from the disc. Pardon my laughter, Hoshik said, but surely you jest. As a matter of fact, said Retief, we ourselves seldom use weapons. I seem to recall that our first contact of skirmish forms involved the use of a weapon by one of your units. My apologies, said Retief. The, uh, the skirmish form failed to recognise that he was dealing with a sportsman. Still, now that we have commenced so merrily with weapons, Hoshik signalled and the servant refilled tubes. There is an aspect I haven't yet mentioned, Retief went on. I hope you won't take this personally, but the fact is our skirmish forms think of weapons as something one employs only in dealing with certain specific life forms. Oh, curious. What forms are those? Vermin, or varmints as some call them. Deadly antagonists, but lacking in caste. I don't want our skirmish forms thinking of such worthy adversaries as yourself as varmints. Dear me, I hadn't realised, of course. Most consider of you to point it out. Hoshik clucked in dismay. I see that skirmish forms are much the same among you as with us, lacking in perception. He laughed scratchily. Imagine considering us as, what was the word, varmints? Which brings us to the crux of the matter. 
You see, we're up against a serious problem with regard to skirmish forms. A low birth rate. Therefore, we've reluctantly taken to substitutes for the mass action so dear to the heart of the sportsman. We've attempted to put an end to these contests altogether. Hoshik coughed explosively, sending a spray of wine into the air. What are you saying? he gasped. Are you proposing that Hoshik of the Mosaic of the Two Dawns abandon honour? Sir, said Retief sternly, you forget yourself. I, Retief of the Red Tape Mountain, make an alternate proposal more in keeping with the newest sporting principles. New? cried Hoshik. My dear Retief, what a pleasant surprise. I'm enthralled with novel modes. One gets so out of touch. Do elaborate. It's quite simple, really. Each side selects a representative, and the two individuals settle the issue between them. I, um, fear I don't understand. What possible significance could one attach to the activities of a couple of random skirmish forms? I haven't made myself clear, said Retief. He took a sip of wine. We don't involve the skirmish forms at all. That's quite passé. You don't mean... That's right. You and me. Outside on the starlit sand, Retief tossed aside the power pistol, followed it with the leather shirt Swayze had lent him. By the faint light he could just make out the towering figure of the flapjack rearing up before him, his trappings gone. A silent rank of flapjack retainers were grouped behind him. "'I fear I must lay aside the translator now, Retief,' said Hoshik. He sighed and rippled his fringed tentacles. "'My spawn fellows will never credit this. Such a curious turn fashion has taken. How much more pleasant it is to observe the action of the skirmish forms from a distance.' "'I suggest we use Tennessee rules,' said Retief. "'They're very liberal. Biting, gouging, stomping, kneeing, and of course choking, as well as the usual punching, shoving, and kicking. Hmm, these gambits seem geared to forms employing rigid endoskeletons. I fear I shall be at a disadvantage.' "'Of course,' Retief said, "'if you'd prefer a more plebeian type of contest.' "'By no means. But perhaps we could rule out tentacle twisting just to even it.' Very well. Shall we begin? With a rush, Hoshik threw himself at Retief, who ducked, whirled, and leaped on the flapjack's back, and felt himself flipped clear by a mighty ripple of the alien slab-like body. Retief rolled aside as Hoshik turned on him. He jumped to his feet and threw a right haymaker to Hoshik's midsection. The alien whipped his left fringe around in an arc that connected with Retief's jaw, sent him spinning onto his back, and Hoshik's weight struck him. Retief twisted, tried to roll. The flat body of the alien blanketed him. He worked an arm free, drumming blows on the leathery back. Hoshik nestled closer. Retief's air was running out. He heaved up against the smothering weight. Nothing budged. It was like burial under a dump truck load of concrete. He remembered the ranger form he had captured. The sensitive orifice had been placed ventrally, in what would be the thoracic area. He groped, felt tough hide set with horny granules. He would be missing skin tomorrow, if there was a tomorrow. His thumb found the orifice and probed. The flapjack recoiled. Retief held fast, probed deeper, groping with the other hand. If the alien were bilaterally symmetrical, there would be a set of ready-made handholds. There were. Retief dug in, and the flapjack writhed, pulled away. Retief held on, scrambled to his feet, threw his weight against the alien and fell on top of him, still gouging. Hoshik rippled his fringe wildly, flopped in terror, then went limp. Retief relaxed, released his hold, and got to his feet, breathing hard. Hoshik humped himself over onto his ventral side, lifted and moved gingerly over to the sidelines. His retainers came forward, assisted him into his trappings, strapped on the translator, he sighed heavily, adjusted the volume. "'There is much to be said for the old system,' he said. "'What a burden one's sportsmanship places on one at times.' "'Great sport, wasn't it?' said Retief. "'Now, I know you'll be eager to continue. If you'll just wait while I run back and fetch some of our gouger forms.' "'May hide ticks devour the gouger forms!' Hoshik bellowed. "'You've given me such a sprong ache as I'll remember each spawning time for a year.' Speaking of hide ticks, said Retief, we've developed a biter form. Enough! 
Hoshik roared so loudly that the translator bounced on his hide. Suddenly I yearn for the crowded yellow sands of Jack. I had hoped, he broke off, drew a rasping breath. I had hoped, Retief, he said, speaking sadly now, to find a new land here, where I might plan my own mosaic, till these alien sands, and bring forth a crop of paradise lichen as should glut the markets of a hundred worlds. But my spirit is not equal to the prospect of biterforms and gougerforms without end. I am shamed before you. To tell you the truth, I'm old-fashioned myself. I'd rather watch the action from a distance, too. But surely your spawn fellows would never condone such an attitude? My spawn fellows aren't here. And besides, didn't I mention it? No one who's really in the know would think of engaging in competition by mere combat if there were any other way. Now, you mentioned tilling the sand, raising lichens, things like that. That on which we dined but now, said Hoshik, and from which the wine is made. The big news in fashionable diplomacy today is farming competition. Now, if you'd like to take these deserts and raise lichen, we'll promise to stick to the oases and vegetables. Hoshik curled his back in attention. Retief, you're quite serious. You would leave all the fair sand hills to us? The whole works, Hoshik. I'll take the oases. Hoshik rippled his fringes ecstatically. Once again you have outdone me, Retief, he cried. This time in generosity. We'll talk over the details later. I'm sure we can establish a set of rules that will satisfy all parties. Now, I've got to get back. I think some of the gouger forms are waiting to see me. It was nearly dawn when Retief gave the whistled signal he had agreed on with Potter, then rose and walked into the camp circle. Swayze stood up. There you are, he said. We've been wondering whether to go out after you. Lemuel came forward, one eye black to the cheekbone. He held out a raw-boned hand. Sorry I jumped you, stranger. Tell you the truth, I thought you were some kind of stool pigeon from the CDT. Bert came up behind Lemuel. How do you know he ain't, Lemuel? he said. Maybe he... Lemuel floored Bert with a backward sweep of his arm. Next cotton picker says some embassy Johnny can call me gets worse than that. Tell me, said Retief, how are you boys fixed for wine? Wine? Mister, we've been living on stump water for a year now. Dorby's fatal to the kind of bacteria it takes to ferment liquor. Try this, Retief handed over a squat jug. Swayze drew the cork, sniffed, drank and passed it to Lemuel. Mister, where do you get that? The flapjacks make it. Here's another question for you. Would you concede a share in this planet to the flapjacks in return for a peace guarantee? At the end of a half hour of heated debate, Lemuel turned to Retief. We'll make any reasonable deal, he said. I guess they got as much right here as we have. I think we'd agree to a 50-50 split. That'd give about 150 oases to each side. What would you say to keeping all the oases and giving them the desert? Lemuel reached for the wine jug, eyes on Retief. Keep talking, mister, he said. I think you got yourself a deal. Consul Paswin glanced up at Retief, went on perusing a paper. Sit down, Retief, he said absently. I thought you were over on Pueblo or Mudflat or whatever they call that desert. I'm back. Paswin eyed him sharply. Well, well, what is it you need, man? Speak up. Don't expect me to request any military assistance, no matter how things are. Retief passed a bundle of documents across the desk. Here's the treaty, and a mutual assistance pact declaration and a trade agreement. Eh? Paswin picked up the papers, riffled through them. He leaned back in his chair, beamed. Well, Retief, expeditiously handled. He stopped, blinked at Retief. You seem to have a bruise on your jaw. I hope you've been conducting yourself as befits a member of the embassy staff. I attended a sporting event, Retief said. One of the players got a little excited. Well, it's one of the hazards of the profession. One must pretend an interest in such matters. Paswin rose, extended a hand. You've done well, my boy. Let this teach you the value of following instructions to the letter. Outside, by the hall incinerator drop, Retief paused long enough to take from his briefcase a large buff envelope 
still sealed, and drop it in the slot. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this story, hit the like button and subscribe for more sci-fi read-alongs every Monday and Friday. If you'd like to support the channel more and get access to narrations of full novels plus a monthly novelette, consider signing up to my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash stories from the sky SFF. Retief is an iconic character of Keith Laumer's. For another story showcasing his talents, check out my narration of Cultural Exchange. A link to that video is on screen now.